Raider Nation, what is going on? Eddie Pascal and Engineer Jim here back at Raiders HQ in beautiful Henderson, Nevada. And welcome, welcome, welcome to a very special edition of Upon Further Review brought to you by the good people at Coors Light. And speaking of Coors Light, we're going to talk about a lot about Coors Light over the next, I don't know, let's call it, call it an hour for the sake of round numbers because we are really, really excited about today's show. And I teased it last week, so those of you who listened to us last week kind of know where we're going. But today... On Upon Further Review, we debut our Tom Flores Hall of Fame Spectacular. So for those of you who don't know, Coach Tom Flores, finalist once again for the Hall of Fame. And we will find out literally in a few days whether or not he gets in. And so leading up to the big day or the big night or whenever they get around to letting these folks know whether they got in or not, leading into that event, we decided we are going to put together a show dedicated exclusively for making the pitch why Coach Flores should be in. Now, for those of you who have been with us for a little bit, you know that we have done this before. And we haven't done it to this extent, but we have made the case for Coach time and time again. And I'm, ugh, I'm keeping my fingers crossed this is the last time that we're going to do it. And helping us do it, because you guys have heard it all from me before. And yes, I'll add a few more thoughts off the top in just a few minutes, but you have heard essentially my spiel before. You have heard my thoughts, my thesis of why Coach Flores needs to be in the Hall of Fame. That's not new to you. My thesis hasn't changed. My argument has not changed why Coach should be in the Hall of Fame. But to help me kind of back up my facts, to help me give a little more credence, a little more oomph to my argument, if you will, we have a trio of guests today. A great, great panel of guests Paul Gutierrez from ESPN covers the silver and black locally here in Las Vegas. Omar Ruiz from NFL Network, very familiar with Tom, as well as John Clayton, who now works for ESPN Radio, but those of you have, you've seen him everywhere. And the good thing about John is John has been a vocal advocate for not a year, not two years, but for a very, very long time for why Coach Flores should be in the Hall of Fame. And then, of course, Wrapping it all up in a nice, beautiful bow on the back end of the show is Coach Flores himself. So we are going to have a lot of fun today, this afternoon, this morning, this night, whenever you listen to the show. We are going to have a lot of fun. We are going to have some good conversation. And I hope, hope, hope this is the last time that we make the pitch for Coach Flores to get into the hall. Because it is a long time coming, ladies and gentlemen. This is a conversation that we have had too many times. But I really, in my heart of hearts, at my core, I think this is the last one. I do. And with the help of Coors Light and those of you, like I said, we're going to talk a lot, a lot about Coors Light over the next couple, uh, call it an hour, like I said. But if you look at the campaign they put together to help Coach get in, and we're going to talk to Tom about that as well. If you look at the cans, and spoiler alert, I've seen the cans, and the cans are incredible. They are really, really cool. But I think it just goes to show how many people are looking at this situation and saying, how do we right this wrong? How do we get Coach into the Hall of Fame? It's been long enough. We've had these conversations time and time again. Now is the time to let him in. He should have been in a decade ago. I believe that. A lot of the panelists that you're going to hear from in a little bit, they believe the same thing, that he should have already been in. But we're not here to, to, you know, look at revisionist history. We are here to make the pitch once again for why Tom Flores should be in the Hall of Fame. And as I said, you guys have heard enough from me. You want to hear from Paul G. and John and Omar, and I get that. But I'm just going to say this. Hopefully for the last time, I will deliver my 90-second version of why Coach Flores should be in the Hall of Fame. And when I look at it, when I look at the body of work, when I look at everything that has gone into Tom Flores' career in, fo in football, in professional football, to me it comes down for two, to two things. First and foremost, he was a pioneer for the game. That's the first part. And secondly, and as important, he just won. So let's just dive in real quick. If we start with the pioneer portion of what Coach Flores has meant to the game, he was the first Latino quarterback in pro football history. He was the first person to win the Super Bowl as a player, assistant coach, and as a head coach. 
He was the first minority head coach to win a Super Bowl, and he was the first minority president and general manager in the National Football League. And that means something. That carries weight, especially when you think about the fact that there are only two Latinos in the Hall of Fame, and there are no Latino head coaches in the Hall of Fame. I don't know, given that information, I don't understand how coach is not in, as I said, the first minority head coach to win a Super Bowl. I don't get it. I really don't. And I don't understand that for numerous reasons, but I especially don't understand it when you look at coach's resume, and he has the resume to back it up. So not only was he a pioneer, not only did he change the literal face of the National Football League, being a brown face, a Mexican-American face, a Latino face in the NFL, being the first in so many aspects of this game. Not only did he do that, as I said, he won. He has got the resume. When you objectively look at the numbers, he is a Hall of Famer. And we throw around the term just win baby a lot around here. We do. I get that. And it's fun. It's, it's a fun thing to yell. I yell it all the time. If you're a fan of this team, it's become kind of synonymous with your fandom. It's one of the most iconic phrases in, national, in the National Football League's history. Frankly, it's one of the most iconic phrases in, in probably sports history. Those three words, just win, baby. But that's all Coach Flores did. All he did was win. And when you're in a game like the NFL, or excuse me, when you're in a game like football, especially if you're a head coach, you are ultimately judged on wins and losses. And there's a lot of, oh, there's a lot of ambiguity. There's a lot of this. There's a lot of that. But at the end of the day, it's pretty easy. You are judged on wins and losses. And as I said, Coach Flores just won. And not even taking into account the myriad Hall of Fame players that he coached, the Hall of Fame players that he groomed, the Hall of Fame players that he got the most out of, not even taking those guys into account, which is practically impossible, but just for the sake of this argument, let's try. Not even doing that. Just look at these numbers. I'm going to read them off real quick, guys. During his time as, a, as the head coach of the Silver and Black, nine years, Flores had a winning percentage of 610. That is a higher winning percentage than Bill Walsh, Tom Landry, and Chuck Knoll. The thing that all three of those gentlemen share, they're all enshrined in Canton. Tom Flores is not. Hmm, interesting. And look, I'm not here to disparage anyone else in the Hall of Fame. I don't want to do that. That's the last thing that I want to do. I just want to show that comparatively, when you look at Coach's body of work, it is a Hall of Fame body of work. And in addition to just winning, in addition to the unreal winning percentage he had, Coach won when the lights were the brightest, when the pressure was at its most intense, the playoffs. He has a winning percentage in the playoffs of 727. I'll just repeat that because that's a big number and I just had to double check it myself. 727. There is only one person, there is one coach in NFL history that is a higher playoff winning percentage than Coach Flores. Vince Lombardi, the man that the literal Super Bowl trophy is named after. The only person that has a better winning percentage in the playoffs that won more and more consistently in the postseason than Tom Flores is Vince Lombardi. That's the list. That is the list, guys. That is, it's, look, it is not a long list. And it just goes to show you that when you're talking about the history of this game, when you were talking about the guys that did it at the highest level, did it for a long time, and did it in meaning, more meaningful ways than others, Tom Flores has to be on that list. He is on that list. Historically, objectively, statistically speaking, he is on that list. So like I said, over the next bit of time as you listen to this episode of the show, I hope you guys enjoy it. You learn a little something. But I, my goal for all of us is that at the end of this, you can look, you know, you look at Tom's body of work and you say, that is a Hall of Famer. 
because when I look at it, that's what I see. I see a Hall of Famer. So without further ado, like I said, we got a lot of really, really good guests to get to this afternoon, this evening, whenever. So here we go, and we're going to start things off with Paul Gutierrez from ESPN. I'm going to ask you just a simple question, and it's a conversation that you and I have had multiple times. How did we get to the point where you and I are having this conversation in January of 2021 of why why Coach Flores needs to be in the Hall of Fame. How did we get here? Well, you know, what's interesting, Eddie, and, and thanks for having me on here, is that this conversation probably should have been had a decade ago, if not before then. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's great that we're having the conversation. If for nothing else, it means that he's at the doorstep. And he was at the doorstep a couple of years ago. He probably should have got in last year with that special blue ribbon uh, committee they put together. Didn't happen. But now here we are, the, the Hall of Fame and its wisdom, so to speak, is put together these separate categories where there's a certain it's, it's just a coach. A coach will go in as a part of this class, uh, or at least the coach is nominated for this class. And, and it's a simple yes or no vote uh, for this, for the committee. And, and you go from there. So based on his body of work as a coach, and then in the back of the voters minds a, a little bit, you got to think it's everything else that the man has done for professional football. Uh, you know, I'm sure we'll get into the resume later, but it's, it's, it's nice that we're having the conversation, albeit it should have happened 10 years ago, but Hey, I'm sure he'll take it. His family will take it and Raider nation and, and uh, people that observe the game and love the game will take it as well. I mean, a thousand percent. And we talked about the body of work. And like you said, Paul, we are going to talk about that in a sec, but I guess I just don't understand from someone who obviously has not covered this team as long as you have and has the history with coach Flores that you do. I guess I just don't understand the logic for him not being in, if that makes sense. Like when you look at it, when you look at it on yeah. paper, you go, this is a hall of famer. So I guess I just don't understand why, it, why we have even gotten to this point. Yeah, and I think a lot of it goes to the way the the process works. Um, there becomes a logjam, and if guys don't get in right away, they kind of become forgotten. Uh, the main thing that has been held against Tom for all these years is he took over a team that was good and, and then won a Super Bowl with them, and then the team moved and won another Super Bowl. At that point, you think, okay, hey, done, automatic Hall of Famer. I've been banging this drum since at least – uh, for at least 15 years or so, when I worked at the Sacramento Bee, to csnbayarea.com, to ESPN now. Why, why is Tom Flores not uh, a candidate, let alone in the hall? Same thing with Jim Plunkett. Um, and, and I think a lot of it, actually I know in talking to, to selectors and voters, is, is that he was overshadowed as a coach. He's not a guy that was a me-first guy. He wasn't banging his chest. He wasn't saying, hey, look at me. He just quietly went about his job and won. Same thing as a player when he was the Iceman. And, and I know, again, it's interesting with the new campaign for him there, too. But he wasn't a self-promoter. And when you look at a lot of the coaches that get in, what do they all have in common? They're on TV. They're in your living room. They're in your face. They're getting that attention. So for, for Tom to get this, this shine now, so to speak, it's way overdue. But it's interesting that, that now he's getting the attention and he's, he's in TV screens and now people are talking about it a lot, though. Yeah, and you and I were talking about this before we started rolling, and we talked about this a handful of times, right? Is that Raiders fatigue? You hear that term yep. thrown around so often. And to me, the one thing that I don't understand is that the Hall of Fame is supposed to be for the best of the best, the creme de la creme. And when you talk about this Raiders fatigue, oh, there's too many guys that have gone in. Doesn't that, isn't that counterintuitive, right? You want the best people. So it feels like you're almost punishing the organization for having that sustained success during that era. And I just, I, it's just hard for me to kind of stomach that and hard for me to kind of make sense of, if Raiders fatigue is a real thing and why, like why that's even in, in our lexicon right now, you know? Yeah. And, and that's part of it too, Eddie, is when you look at the way the, the hall of fame class is selected, you've got people that go into a room and, and I, I wrote this story, I want to say in 2006, 2007, and it's not to take a shot at the, the selectors that are in there. I believe it's up to 46 selectors are in a room discussing it. Um, but I was told by one of the, you know, foremost known renowned NFL writers at the time, Dr. Z from mm -hmm. Sports Illustrated. And I asked him, hey, when did you first start voting for the Hall of Fame? And, and he's gone now, so rest in peace, Dr. Z. But he told me he, the only way he could remember is because it was a Hall of Fame vote where he had to vote for somebody that he didn't necessarily thought deserved to be in the Hall. I'm like, wait, what, a minute, what, what are you talking about? He said, because they basically go in there and they have to sponsor their guys. Each team is ba basically has a sponsor that walks in and presents a case, and then they vote about it. And then there's a lot of backroom kind of deals that happen. And I'm not trying to, to – these people that do this work, they're doing the heavy lifting. I'm not going to diminish what they do. But it, it, a lot of times it comes down to that. So if I want Tom Flores in, for example, uh, somebody else wants somebody else in, I might have to grin and bear it because I need that guy's vote. I need that support. I need that politicking going on. And for Tom Flores, 
what else would hurt him as well is that coaches before this year, uh, before the Blue Ribbon Committee in uh, last year too, they were competing against other players. So if you're a voter and you're looking at a player versus a coach, where are you going to go? Mm-hmm. You're most likely going to go with the, with the player. So he just kept getting pushed to the back of the line, back of the line, back of the line. And then again, two other things that really hurt him was the Al Davis factor. A lot of people saw him as, oh, he was just an Al Davis puppet. Not true. And uh, John Madden dealt with that a lot at first, too, until he broke through uh, with the video games, with the TV announcing and things like that. And the other thing was he didn't really have a lot of success in Seattle either. But again, as I'm sure you've talked to other people in the league around the industry, um, up there, John Clayton is a big proponent of Tom Flores because he covered the Seahawks back then. And he said that should not be held against Tom Flores. That was the worst ownership in a modern major sports history. So uh, there's so many different factors as to why he's not in yet. But there's also um, some good that has been done to kind of alleviate this this logjam. And, and and again, I know you're you're a big fan of it and a proponent of it, and we'll see exactly where it goes from here. But it just feels like this is this is the right thing to do and the right time to do it while he's still here to enjoy it with his family, with his friends, with his fans. A thousand percent. And Paul, when we were putting together the show, when we were looking at putting the rundown together and who we wanted on the show, it was really important for us that we had someone that came and talked to us, that covers the team regularly, that knows this team, that knows this organization, that knows what is important to the Raiders, everything, right? And so when you, in your experience, what would it mean for not only the team, but the fan base to have Coach Flores inducted into the Hall of Fame, where, frankly, a lot of people believe that's where he should be and he should have been 10, 15, 20 years ago. Yeah, as as rabid and as crazy as Raider Nation is, it's also just as inclusive, as long as you buy in, right? And, and I've noticed that over the years. I mean, it's, it's diverse. It's eclectic. Uh, it, it has all walks of life in it. Um, there's one section of it, though, that I've seen, and, and it, it's personal to me being a, a Latino male and I'm, I can't even say I'm a young Latino male anymore <laughs> but I mean the man you know when I was growing up in Southern California um, he reminded me so much of my paternal grandpa mm. and the first time I ever met Tom Flores it's a true story uh, we I graduate high school Barstow High School class of 1988 we go to Hawaii for our senior trip we fly back we're getting our luggage at LAX and I see Raider bags starting to come through the luggage carousel and I'm sitting there I'm looking I'm like Oh, which Raider was on the flight with us? And I look and I see a man come up and grab his bags and it was Tom. So I tell Tom this story all the time that I met you when I was 18 years old. And now it's just funny how the world goes around. And I, I tell you that story because that's how personal it was to me. And it's personal to the, the Latino fan base, especially the Mexican American Chicano fan base of the Raiders, which is burgeoning and has a huge and, and Tom Flores and, and Jim Plunkett, you know, in Mexico, they, they're icons down there as well. And, and you saw that when the Raiders are playing down there, too. So it, it means so much more than just, oh, great, we got another Hall of Famer, so to speak, for the Raider fans. It, it's, it's, it's personal. And it goes back to the time, and I, and I just go back to, to my, my young days when I'm 12 years old and the Raiders moved to L.A. And I'm like, oh, oh, that's what they're all about. That's why my dad was a Raider fan. So I, I get it. And from the Latino fan perspective, it's another step toward acceptance. But it's also not just acceptance, but celebrating all the achievements finally, and letting the man have his day in the sun. Yeah, I mean, very well said, Paul. And I think that the NFL has done, you know, I give credit where it's due. I think they've done a lot better as of late, kind of preaching this message of inclusion and, you know, everyone's welcome and all that, right? But I think that when you look at that, that message of inclusion, I think it carries a lot more weight if you put a guy like Coach Flores in the Hall of Fame, right? And not only simply simply because he's a Mexican-American, because he's Latino, because you look at his resume, and the resume speaks for itself. And it just, to me, I feel like the message is, it's just so much more effective if you can put him in the Hall of Fame, and you can give young Mexican-American kids out there, guys like me, right, who are a little bit younger than you, probably not too much, Paul, but guys who are in, <laughs> you know, a little bit younger than you, guys like me, kids that, you know, one day that my kids can look and say, hey, there's a guy who looks like me in the Hall of Fame. There is a guy who looks like me that not only was a quarterback, not only a coach, he was a front office executive. And I think that's a powerful message the NFL has a chance to, to kind of send to kids and do it in the right way. And when you take, even if you were to take that off, which you can't, nor should you, you look at his resume. And, exactly. and I'm, a big, I'm a big proponent of, can you tell the history of the NFL without mentioning this person? Absolutely not. The first Latino starting quarterback in the NFL, the first minority head coach to win a Super Bowl and did it twice. Uh, the first person, regardless of race, to win a Super Bowl as a player, an assistant coach and a head coach. 
uh, before my Gitka did it. And you throw all these things together, and then you're like, what are, what are people missing? Oh, I guess it's Seattle. I guess it's Al Davis. I guess that he left before he coached for 10 years here. But for, for that five, six-year period here, from 1980 through 85, there was his record was unbelievable. And when you look at what his record is against other coaches that are already in Canton, it's unbelievable that, that he's not there and doesn't get more respect. He was 6-0 and against Don Shula, the winningest coach in NFL history, while he was with the Raiders. And I believe he finished seven and one, uh, something like that. He, he's got a winning record against Bill uh, Parcells, a winning record against Bill Walsh, a winning record against Don Lan- uh, against Tom Landry, Don Coriel, who was a finalist with them. He was 12 and five against Air Coriel. I mean, what else needs to be said? Then you throw everything else in there about inclusion. It's a no brainer. Yeah. And you know, it's funny too. And that's, that's one of the things that we talked a lot about uh, the last time that coach was up for the, the hall of fame and he didn't get in was we were comparing him to the other coaches that did get in. And right. I'm yeah. not, I'm not here to, to disparage anyone for who's in the hall of fame. Who's not, all, not in the hall of fame. But like you said, you look at those records and if you, as a player, as a coach, as anyone, right, you want to see how you did against the best. You want to see how you stacked up against the very best at their jobs. And he held up incredibly well. He held up at a historic rate. So to me, it's just another, another what? Like, wh- what are yeah. we doing here type moment? I don't get it. I really don't. Well, especially when you talk to the guys that he coached, the Hall of Famers that he coached. Marcus That's another Allen thing, is, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Marcus Allen is on the record as saying, hey, look, uh, you know, people make too much about X's and O's. This guy was a calming influence in this locker room, and, and he held this team together. Howie Long, I talked to Howie Long about the man. Same thing. He said, you can't put a price tag on what he meant to that locker room in terms of all the colorful characters that were in there. And there was the ice man, just keeping it cool, keeping it smooth and keeping the machine going uh, until it stopped. And uh, again, to have four rings, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's amazing that, that uh, it's taken this long to get to this point, but, but maybe this injustice will be done soon enough. And, and um, you know, it's always hard. I have, I have conversations with, with selectors and uh, you know, all, keep their name out of it, but they, they take pride as they should uh, in, in making it a very selective hall. So anytime I say, Oh, well, I want somebody in Oh, that you can't just say that so-and-so should be in. You have to take somebody out. Okay. Well then give me Tom Flores and his four rings and I'll take Marv Levy and his four Super Bowl losses out. Oh, oh, I didn't want to hear about that. And I'm like, again, I'm not disparaging Marv Levy should be in the hall of fame. He is in the hall of fame, but there's just something that's missing. It's not a complete hall when you're missing somebody as accomplished and is uh, diverse, really, as Tom Flores. This is wrapping up with Paul Gutierrez. And, and Paul, if you were to explain Coach Flores to someone, if you were to explain his resume, what he meant to the game, for someone, you know, one, one day from now, you know, many years from now, my kids, if you were to explain Tom Flores to them and his importance to the game and why he deserves to be enshrined in Canton, I mean, what do you, what do you say? Like, kind of what's your pitch? A groundbreaking pioneer who succeeded at every level of the game when given the opportunity. And really, it's that simple. Then you throw everything else on top of it. You throw in the the diversity. You throw in uh, what he meant to a certain community. That's just extra. That's that's like to to go from an A to an A plus, right? Um, that's that's how I present it. That's how I talk about it. And sometimes, Eddie, to be honest, I I sometimes can't see the forest for the trees because I'm so close to it. I've been so passionate about it, and I'm so happy and I'm so excited for him that we really might be this close to it finally happening. Uh, you know, one of the stories that broke my heart two years ago, um, he's sitting in the in the stands at uh, uh, the Canton Canton um, for the Hall of Fame induction ceremony. And he sees one of the players he drafted, Kevin Mawai with the, with the Seattle Seahawks. And he gets a text. He looks at his phone and uh, he sees that it's from Cliff Branch. And Cliff was texting him to tell him, hey, they just added this new blue ribbon committee. You're in, coach. And, and, and Tom told me that he looked at it and he put it down and thought, I'm going to respond to Cliff when I get a second to be a little more thoughtful in my response. He was going to write him back, no, we're both in. So it means a lot to him. It means a lot to his former players. And again, it would mean so much more for him to enjoy it uh, while he's still here with us and, and with his family as well. Yeah, very well said. It obviously means a lot to everyone in this building. The, the candidacy for coaches is something that's very near and dear to a lot of our hearts in this in this department and really in this organization. So, Paul Gutierrez, man, we thank you so much for carving out a little bit of time for us. Stay safe, stay healthy, and uh, hopefully the next time we see you, we're doing it uh, in real life, not this virtual thing. Sounds good, Eddie. Thanks for having me. I'm proud of you. Who are you? Get it. New Orleans, here we go. And we're joined by John Clayton. And John, 
How did we get to this point? I asked the, the other guests on the program today this exact question. How did we get to this point where you and I are having this conversation in January of 2021, trying to make the case for Coach Flores to get into the Hall of Fame? Well, to be honest, it's a 20-year mission for me. And the idea is, that obviously, going back and knowing Tom so well from the days with the Rangers and the Seahawks and all that stuff. But this goes back on a different subject. Because when I sat next to Will McDonough for so many years in the Pro Football Hall of Fame. Obviously, he was my mentor. He taught me so much about getting sources, what to do with sources, and what to do in the National Football League. And he also taught me about the Hall of Fame. So I get into the Hall of Fame as a voter in 1988. Okay, And so one of the things that Will continued to push while he was still alive was having a coach category and a contributor category. And, of course, the idea is when a coach or a contributor goes up against a player, the player 95% of the time is going to win. And so uh, when we unfortunately lost Will McDonough, I was the one in the biggest area to try to push every year I could, every year, to try to have a coach category and a contributor category. And so – once we had Paul Tagliabue available, who's still not in the Hall of Fame, to go is vote, be voted in, you know, I had enough support with people in the ownership ranks and the uh, hall to be able to get the contributor category. But unfortunately, they did not put the coach category. So now here's Tom and here's Don Coriel, here's all these other coaches going against players and for the most part losing. All right. So then finally, in the last two years, I continued to make the push so that we would have a coach category, and sure enough, we now have it for four years. Now, the great part about the coach category and what helped uh, in doing this is that I was on the 100-year uh, NFL committee voting for that, and we had a coach category there. We had a GM category, a contributor category. That, of course, got Ron Wolf in, and so then uh, – you know, we've got the coach category, and then this past year, I continued to push for the idea to have you know, Tom Flores and other, and we finally got it to the point where now it's a yes or no vote, and that yes vote is probably going to be coming here in the next week or so. So, and John, I, I'm curious. We've talked to a handful of people about this throughout the league, and I'm kind of just curious for your kind of two cents on, on this idea, this notion, if you will, of Raiders fatigue. And we've heard that term thrown around so much as the past five years or so, especially around Hall of Fame time, where there are voters and whoever it is just, oh, there's too many members of the Silver and Black going in. Do you put any stock into that? Do you buy that notion at all? Or is that just something that folks uh, like myself on the outside kind of think of and hear? Well, I mean, it's, there's a, a validity to it. And, of course, you know, going back where I'm so fortunate to go back to the days covering, you know, the Raiders, the Steelers back in the 1970s, right? Because I go back to my first year covering, I was uh, 17 years old in high school covering mm -hmm. the Steelers in 1972, you know, uh, and you saw the great success that the Raiders had, the Houston Oilers had, the Pittsburgh Steelers had. And just being able to cover so much of that was so great. And, of course, you saw all the great players that have been voted into the Hall of Fame. But no, there's, there's a validity to it, but you also throw in the Green Bay Packers as a, as a Packer fatigue. And so it affects certain players, particularly what ends up happening is that, you know, it's a little bit of the fatigue, but also the fact that now so many of the players, you know, like the Cliff Branches and the Lester Hayes and all of that, L.C. Greenwood, you know, there, there's a generation of voters that never saw them play and don't understand how good these guys are. And so they get into the senior category, and the senior category is such that uh, it takes a long time to be able to try to you know, get that. But in the end, it's like uh, you, you get the, the chance to get these guys in whenever you can, and we're trying like anything to make sure we do that. You know, doesn't it seem kind of silly to me as well? It almost seems counterintuitive, right, John, where the Hall of Fame is supposed to be for the, ec the most excellent, right, the creme de la creme. And it feels like with whether it's Raiders fatigue, Packers fatigue, uh, Steelers fatigue, whatever it is, insert team name here – that you almost punish the players and the coaches and the, and the folks associated with those teams because they were so good. Like, it, like, to me, that's never really made sense, just logically breaking it out, you know? Well, understand that the Hall of Fame, since having its first vote, and I think that was in 1963, has always been playing catch-up. Mm. So in other words, you start voting in 63, obviously that was before my time as far as covering the league or anything like that. I was, what, nine years old at the time, but it's like, uh, what happens is you're now trying to catch up the players from the 30s, the 40s, and the 50s, and you know, in, in the early 60s. Now, obviously, they weren't being voted on at that time, but you're always playing catch-up. And I see this every year because I'm one of the biggest advocates 
of you know the carryover votes. You know, trying to get the ones who have been waiting for some time to get in. You know, like for example, and what ends up happening is that you get positions to get so backed up. Like yeah, you know, I still remember you know when it took so long for Derek Thomas to get in because there was six pass rushers at that time. It took so long for Art Monk and uh, you know Andre Reed to get in because we had about four or five wide receivers. We're going through one right now with the offensive line. You know, Steve Hutchinson, it took some time to get in, Kevin Mawai, and we still have two more, at least, that need to get in, hopefully this year, and Alan Fanica, Tony Baselli, because they both deserve to get in. But we're always playing catch-up, and then what happens is you have a year like this where you could have, you know, three, maybe four guys who could be first ballot. You know, for example, you know Peyton Manning's going to make it. You know Charles Woodson's going to make it. We'll see about, uh, you know, whether Megatron is going to make it, Calvin Johnson, and there's a chance at Jared Allen. And so with only five votes, five guys getting in, it makes it tougher because then you move everything back a year. Mm. And, and so, John, you know, when we look at – we've obviously – this has been such a long time coming for Coach Flores in terms of even getting to this point. Obviously, he's been a finalist on multiple occasions prior to this. But when you look at his career, you look at his body of work, his resume, whatever you want to call it, it almost, to me, it speaks for itself. It, it reads as a Hall of Fame resume, but the one mm -hmm. issue that folks have typically in the, in the conversations that we've had are his years in Seattle, where unfortunately he didn't have the type of on-field success that he found when he was in silver and black. Do you put any credence into those years, or should his the work that he did, the incredible things that he did as a pioneer for the game, all of that kind of stuff as a Raider, should that almost kind of supersede and take precedence over what happened at the end in Seattle? So who do you think would be the one in the room that would raise that, having covered that team. Having, and again, you know, it's like this wasn't Tom Flores' fault. It was Ken Baring's fault. I hate to bring up an Oakland guy like Ken, but Ken was a terrible owner. And he made things so tough for Tom to be able to succeed. And, of course, I, I covered those teams closely because I was at the News Tribune covering it, and I saw all the bad parts of what was going on. And I'm the one every year in the room that Tom's in the room in the 15 saying, you've got to eliminate any of the Seattle stuff. Anything that didn't go right in Seattle, trust me, I covered this. You've got to eliminate that thought because what happens is you know, they take those thoughts into account, and next thing you know, it's like it pulls down what happened in Oakland. And that's, I think, so unfair. But I can tell you, every year, and it'll be this year too, I'll remind everybody, take the Seattle part out. And again, I, I made a very impassioned plea once we had the success in getting Tom as the Met one coaching candidate this year of doing it. And fortunately, enough people listened. Can you tell, and this might be a simple question, John, but I have a feeling that it's, it's a complicated answer maybe a little bit, but can you, tell, can you effectively tell the story of professional football without including Tom Flores in that? Uh, well, again, it's like I know that's one of the standard lines that's always sure. used, but of course, when you're talking about the great teams, and he was all part of those great, many of the great teams. I mean, the fact that he wins the two Super Bowls, the fact that he's able to manage some of the most amazing characters in the history of the game and have things go so positive, and then you know each year, whatever new players he's getting, make them comfortable being able to do it. But the story of the league, you know, with, with maybe, you know, with the exception of like Jim Brown and maybe some of the great players, you can tell the story. But again, the story is so much better when you have a great coach who is able to manage one of the great, I mean, you wouldn't call it a dynasty, but one of the great teams in NFL history that lasted through years and was able to maintain that high level. So again, you can tell the story of the National Football League, maybe without Tom Flores, but you also need the story that he needs to go into the Pro Football Hall of Fame, and he will. And just wrapping it up with John Clay. And John, you know, the one thing that I've always respected about Coach, among many things, but you look at him, you look at his life, the circumstances surrounding his life, and he is a man who really dedicated his entire adult life to the game of football, to the betterment of the NFL. And it just doesn't feel like we see that many types of individuals anymore. I know that there's still some out there, and I, I know that you know you look at, at some of the great names that will be going into the Hall of Fame one day, but it just seems like there should be some acknowledgement that this is a man who really did, in all assets of life, dedicate who he wanted to be for the betterment of the Raiders, the, the NFL, and just the game at large. Yeah, and, that's, and, and the great part is he was so humble. Mm -hmm. I mean, he always put the team, the players, the coaching staff above him. That was his personality. 
that's what he did, and that's who he is, and that's what makes him such a special person. I mean, you know, you see him when he was doing the broadcasting, talk to him. He was no different than when he was a coach or when he was a general manager. But what you saw was just a great person who did such a great job. And, again, I hope we're able to continue going with the idea that uh, we can have a coach category. Now, we've got it for about four years. I want that to continue because there's other coaches that need to be rewarded. Very, very well said. Well, John, we appreciate your time so immensely. Thank you for carving some time out this afternoon. Stay safe, stay healthy, and uh, we'll catch up with you soon. Tom, a very special fan, the nation's number one sporting fan, President Ronald Reagan, is standing by live in the White House. You proved tonight that a good defense can be also be a, a pretty good offense. Well, thank you, Mr. President. I really appreciate it. Uh, we played a good game tonight. Our, our players were just tremendous in every phase. We totally dominated. I think we proved to the to the whole world that uh, the silver and black is uh, is the best team. And we are so excited to welcome in our pal from NFL Network, Omar Ruiz. And, and Omar, first off, good to see you, my friend. But I've asked the ever, other people that we've had on the show today, I've asked them all the same question. How did we get to this point where you and I are having this conversation in January of 2021, still trying to make the case for Tom Flores to go into the Hall of Fame? He's certainly one of the most overlooked coaches, I think, in NFL history, and it's a good question, but when you look at at everything he did um, from a coaching standpoint, winning those two championships, two Super Bowls, and forget the trailblazing aspect of it and all the doors that he opened for Hispanics, Latinos, Mexican Americans like myself, forget all that, but just you know what he did as a coach to win two Super Bowls and still not be there. I mean, uh, the fact that we are having this con conversation is disappointing, but I'm hoping this is the final conversation that we're having this year about it. And I'm sure throughout this conversation, we'll go in more in great length on it, but I couldn't be happier to be here, Eddie, and, uh, and to tout for Tom Flores once again, because he's certainly deserving. Yeah, and obviously, you know where our heart is in this conversation. You know, we believe that Coach is undoubtedly a Hall of Famer, and I, I really am optimistic this year, much like you, that this is the last time that you and I will have this chat. But Omar, as a guy who covers the league, as a guy who, you know, is kind of locked in with all 32 teams compared to us, we obviously were very focused on the silver and black. The term that we hear a lot, and we hear it a lot, especially this time of the year when we're talking about the Hall of Fame, is Raiders fatigue. And you're like, oh, there's too many guys that, you know, from this era of the team that are now in the Hall of Fame. And to me, I, I just, I don't understand that. Is that is that something that we're just, you know, from our point of view, we're worse and we're like, ah, oh, you know, it's it's not real, it's not real. But at some point, there is a little validity to it. At least it feels like that from from our situation. That's an interesting point. I've never heard of that. Um, I do think that Al Davis, for the legend that he mm -hmm. is, does get so much credit for the history of the Raiders, the success that he have, and, and deservedly so. But as we've seen with every organization that has dynastic qualities like Al Davis's Raiders did in the 70s and 80s, there is so much more involved than just, you know, one or two people. You look at the steel curtain defense of the Steelers in the 70s and the four Super Bowls that they won. There's countless guys in the Hall of Fame. And eventually, you know, when Bill Belichick and Tom Brady and Rob Gronkowski and the rest of those, you know, Patriots guys, they'll all get in. Um, so, yeah, Raiders fatigue, I'm not sure about. But I, I know Al Davis has deservedly uh, gotten so much credit for everything he did for this organization, for all the winning. But there's a lot of other people that deserve the credit as well. And Tom Flores is one of them. A thousand percent. And we were talking to John Clayton earlier. And one of the things that we talked about in terms of Coach Flores in particular was how well he held up against other Hall of Fame coaches in terms of what his head-to-head -head record with them was. And, and look, I'm not here to disparage any of these guys that got into the Hall of Fame before coach. Like, that's the complete opposite. That's what I don't want to do. But I, it, has, it feels like it has to hold some weight that against the very best of his generation, when the stakes were the highest, when he was going against the creme de la creme, Coach Flores, he didn't even fare pretty well. He fared really, really, really well. And that's the ultimate test, right? The, the dominance in your era, because I think it's unfair to compare guys in the 50s to the guys in the 80s and the guys from the 90s to the guys now with statistics having different values than what they did at different eras in time. But what you did against your peers, it's that dominance in your period of time. And Tom Flores exhibited, like you mentioned, 
uh, that dominance, you know, to win those two Super Bowls. And, and what I kind of in thinking about uh, the last couple of weeks here, um, in addition to, like I said, the coaching qualities that he had, is just keeping that team together, moving from Oakland to Los Angeles. We've seen uh, just how difficult this year it was for the Raiders. I think this Raiders team was a lot better than the record indicated, but a lot of that had to do with managing a move. We saw Jeff Fisher get canned after, not even after his first full season moving the Rams from St. Louis to Los Angeles. We saw Anthony Lynn start off his tenure uh, in LA, moving the Chargers from San Diego to Los Angeles, 0-4 start and eventually lose his job this year. So uh, to go from a Super Bowl team there in Oakland to manage the move down to Los Angeles and still win another Super Bowl and not have that drop off in that era that was as competitive as you mentioned as any, I think speaks volumes too about his leadership and coaching style. And look, Omar, I, I believe in my heart of hearts, and we've talked to so many people, and that's one of the great things that we've been very fortunate to do in, in the position we're in. We get to talk to people that know more football than us, right? But one thing that I really do believe is that Coach Flores' resume, you just look at it, you take the name off, you take Tom Flores' name off, and you look at just objectively the stats, the wins, the success as a player, as a coach, as a front office executive, it's a Hall of Fame resume. And as you said, that's not even including the fact that he was a trailblazer, an icon for the Latino community, for you know, breaking down barriers as a Mexican American, and it feels like that has to that has to count for something, right? As we're trying to trying to put together the Hall of Fame, the best of the best, the fact that he was able to do that and he broke down so many walls and so many barriers that has to that has to count, right? Oh, there's no question about it, and I think you know Jackie Robinson, you know, as an example, is a Hall of Fame player, no question. His stats and everything else belong in Cooperstown, New York, where the Baseball Hall of Fame is. But of course, he became a legend uh, for everything he did off the field and breaking the color barrier. And I think it's, you know, a similar situation with Coach Flores, where his record on the field, uh, his accomplishments deserves to be in Canton, Ohio. But then there's that other aspect of the trailblazing component, you know, first Latino to ever win uh, a Super Bowl as head coach. Um, the first general manager uh, to be a minority in the NFL. You know, certainly a conversation that we're still having here in 2021 mm -hmm. about, you know, minorities and Blacks and Latinos not having, um, you know, the, the numbers that are indicative of what they are for players in the NFL. And for, for him to kind of break down those walls in the early 90s and, and the late 70s, early 80s and the different roles that he had, you know, I think speaks volumes to everything that he dealt with and, and the barriers that he broke down. So uh, no question, Eddie, that the accomplishments, the trailblazing component, it all equals a Hall of Fame uh, caliber resume and one that I hope, you know, gets in this year. You know, it's interesting, Omar, and this is kind of a quick aside, but you brought it up. So it kind of came to my mind. But you talk about we're still having that conversation in 2021, right, about inclusion and making sure that everyone has a seat in the, at the table, that everyone's included in that meeting, right? And I think that by and large, the NFL has done a really, really good job of increasing that inclusion, of making sure that that football in all aspects is more accessible to everyone, regardless of what you look like, you know, what God you pray for, any of that kind of stuff, right? But it's incredible. Yeah, no, no question. Yeah, the NFL uh, certainly knows that it is a problem. It's an issue that something, you know, when when the barriers were broken down uh, in 1989 by Al Davis hiring Art Shell, you know, the first black coach in the Super Bowl era, and of course, Tom Flores, you know, uh, and I know Tom Fears, you know, is the first Latino head coach, um, but, you know, Tom Flores, uh, you know, has the name, you know, the 100% uh, background, um, where you knew exactly kind of where his upbringing was and, and how he came up uh, to, to be the first coach, you know, so again, I know Fears was the first, but I think Tom Flores is the first mm -hmm. to really, you know, succeed at that Super Bowl type level uh, unequivocally uh, first to win the Super Bowl. And then, and then to also, you know, go down in NFL history as the first player assistant coach and head coach to win a Super Bowl. I mean, that's, you know, those are all, I think, you know, trivia that are attached to him, not necessarily Super Bowl uh, Hall of Fame qualities, 
but it's all part of that resume that we talked about that that it's long overdue at this point and um and and the inclusion and the trailblazing aspects again are a part of his story a very deserving story uh, no doubt yeah i mean and the resume like we've said a thousand times it speaks for itself i mean you look at it objectively and that he put together a hall of fame career but but omar you've obviously covered this team you've covered the raiders you're you know, you're a Southern California guy and you know as well as I do how, you know, what kind of stronghold the silver and black still has in Los Angeles. But what do you think it would mean to not only this fan base, if Coach Flores were to be able to get into the Hall of Fame, but specifically the Latino portion of that fan base, being able to celebrate with him, being able to celebrate a man that, for lack of a better term, that looks like us, that looks like you and me, that is now enshrined in Canton with the best people to ever play in Coach's game awesome and i think you know vacation for things that you know me and you have been taught for so long um validate his as true one of the greatest of all time and i think it would be uh, a celebration for the younger generation to see someone um in the pantheon of all-time football to be celebrated like that because i remember you know when i was a kid you had you had tom flores coach you had anthony munoz you know, with the big mustache, kind of look like my Theos and my uncles and, and everything uh, in those days. So it was it was a couple people that were easily identifiable that were two of the best of the best in their respective roles. And I think, you know, for those stories to be told once again to this younger generation, I think would, would mean a lot. And especially when we're always talking about new audiences and growing the game, I think that's especially important uh, here in 2021. And I think, you know, would would open the doors again, you know, just like, you know, maybe he did in the, in the 70s, 80s, and 90s. But the story being told would again break down some barriers and open doors for a new generation to come through and, and perhaps follow in greater numbers um, than they did earlier uh, a few decades ago. And you know, it's interesting to think, too, Omar, is that Coach Flores is, is a man that you look at his not only, not his body of work, but his life. And he's really a man who dedicated his life to the game of football, to the betterment of the silver and black, to growing the game, to being an, an ambassador for what the National Football League is all about. And I, I feel like you don't see that many, for lack of a better term, lifers anymore, right? You don't see guys that have put 50, 60 years into this. And that's, you know, just another thing about him that when I mean, you're looking at his resume that you really have to admire that, like, look, this guy wasn't in for 10 years, had an incredible career and bounced. Like he did this. He was here for the long haul. Yeah, not only that and all the different roles he served within the Raiders organization, but obviously, you know, with the Chiefs and the other organizations he won Super Bowls with. But again, to be that ambassador and, you know, to be to tell his story and to be an inspiration and and to be pulled in all the different ways that he has been and, and to do it so um, overwhelmingly in a positive fashion and without qualms and to kind of put himself out there in that regard, I think. Um, you know, says volumes about him, you know, just getting to know him as a person and chatting with him over the years, just sort of the selfless nature um, that, that he has, that he presents himself with, I think, um, you know, may be a reason why it's taken this long basically because he doesn't put himself out there. He's not there, you know, pounding the table for himself, um, you know, the, the way others might. But um, I think the fact that, you know, hopefully this is the year that he does get recognized and that his sort of selfless nature vacation to the game uh, will be rewarded. And, and that story will be told as well. You know, it's interesting because uh, you're not the only person that's brought that up, that the fact that he is kind of a soft-spoken guy, a guy, he's not the guy that's going to pound his chest and be, look at me, look at me. And he was like that his entire career has almost kind of worked to his detriment now at this point, trying to get him in the hall of fame, which there's some, there's some sweet irony in there, right? That like the guy who's the ultimate team guy is now having to be like, Hey, look, look at me. Like I, I did a pretty good job while I was a player coach and, and front office executive. Well, I think, I, I think, you know, much of the NFL nowadays uh, has become a TV show. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's how, you know, my bills are paid. It's how your bills are paid. Yeah. And, and I have no problem with that. Um, the, the combine is now a TV show. The draft is now a big TV production, all that. And so I think the last couple of years with uh, Bill Cower being, you know, one of the mainstays on the CBS set and, and creating that TV show moment when he was, revealed to be a hall of famer and, and Jimmy Johnson as well, you know, being on that Fox set and Troy Aikman and having that, you know, emotional moment, you know, was a TV show. And maybe those guys zoom past 
uh, Coach Flores in there do just to create that. And, and I'll have a problem with it as long as Tom Flores eventually is because he is just as deserves as, uh, you know, honorable. Those two have been and certainly um, just as belonging. So, uh, you know, if they can do a TV show moment, I'm glad, I'm glad Coors, you know, is, is kind of having with that campaign, the ice and, um, you know, as long as it is, uh, then everything else is all good. And, and uh, but I think it should be noted that, you know, even the Hall of Fame, the announcements and everything have, have had an entertainment flair to them. And hopefully they can attach Tom Flores' name to that this year and, and tell that great story. Yeah, I mean, you're 100% right. And it's not a bad thing. It's not a good thing. It's just the way of the world, right? We're, we're now in the business, yeah. all of us, we're in the business of entertainment. We're in the business of giving people a show. And and the Hall of Fame is not immune from that. But just wrapping up with our friend, with our friend Omar Ruiz. And, and Omar, I'll just ask you this. If, if you were to try to tell your kids one day the importance of Tom Flores, why he is a Hall of Famer, what he brought to the game. I mean, what would you tell them in terms of why he is who he is, I guess, for lack of a better term? Well, I, I would, I mean, for me, I would tell them, hey, you know, he, he comes from a farm town, um, you know, grew up, you know, very modest means, just like your grandparents did. I would say this, you know, to my kids and, and he accomplished this great American dream um, just like we all can, you know, through hard work and dedication and selflessness and really set an example in that way. And by the way, he won two Super Bowls and made all sorts of accomplishments and firsts uh, throughout his life in the NFL and the de dedication to the game of football and, and did so with a, a positive spirit, um, with, with a friendly face, a welcoming attitude. Uh, even in his post years, you know, as a member of the media and, and being a, a voice of the Raiders on, on the broadcast team and has really literally done it all uh, in football as a player, you know, a starter, a backup, an assistant coach, head coach. And, um, and, and I can be, you know, someone who's more proud of, you know, Tom Flores to represent us that way. So I think that that's something I, you know, I'd share with my kids and, and hopefully, when I do tell them the story of Tom Flores, it'll be in Kenton looking at his bust. Very, very well said. Well, hey, Omar, we appreciate you so much for carving out some time for us this afternoon. Stay safe, stay healthy, and hopefully the next time we see you, this won't we won't be doing the Zoom thing, right? I'll be able to come, say what's up, give you a handshake. And, yeah, uh, you know, maybe, yeah, maybe maybe it'll be in Kenton at the hall oh. where we can you know celebrate in person this. So uh, we're keeping our fingers crossed, certainly. And yeah, Eddie, uh, always great to hear from you and look forward to seeing you in person once again. And, and here's the thing about Tom. Tom's not a big personality. Tom's not a toot his own horn kind of guy. And it's almost like the player that doesn't celebrate, that you don't see a lot of. You know, in other words, he does something great, great catch, a sack, a tackle, whatever, and just goes back to the huddle and does his job. That's Tom. And sometimes you could forget how great that player is because that player's not loud. He's not tooting his own horn. He doesn't have, a, you know, a PR mentality, and that's not Tom. And I think that that's hurt him in, in some circumstances, and I think in some people's eyes. And you know what? It's our job. It's our job as players. It's our job as an organization to say enough's enough. It's time. It's time. Let's stop doing this. Tom Flores belongs in the Hall of Fame. And you know that we had to talk to the man himself, Coach Tom Flores, for the Tom Flores Hall of Fame Spectacular, brought to you by the good people of Coors Light. And, Coach, we're going to talk about the beer cans. We're going to talk about all that in a little bit, I promise you, because they are one of the coolest things that I've ever seen. But i got to start here with you. We're living in this crazy virtual world now. You and I are having this conversation via Zoom. How are you doing? How are you kind of just existing in this world that we're living in right now? It's hard. I mean, I, you know, I, I'm, I'm not a, a, a guy. I don't go to parties all the time, but I like to be around people. I like to talk to people. I like to go to things. I like to, I would love to come to, to Vegas again. I haven't been to Vegas, you know, since the uh, first game of the year, the home game. Uh, which I did on radio, but then, then there was nobody there other than Lincoln. I talked with Lincoln, and, uh, and but that was you know, since then I just do the virtual thing. Uh, I miss all my friends. I miss all my Raider friends, uh, all my Raider friends back in Oakland, and um, just people in general. And you can't you 
experience football without a crowd. Uh, it's just not the same thing. They're doing a good job, though. I tell you, you guys in the National Football League are doing a really good job in presenting this. I didn't, I didn't think they could pull it off this far. That's going to be the, the Super Bowl is going to be interesting because they're going to zoom a lot of stuff there, including what we're talking about now. Yeah, I mean, you talk for you, you speak for a lot of us, Coach. Where I think all of us just we miss our friends, right? We miss spending time with people. We miss having those human interactions, having those conversations in real life that we did a year ago. And you know, it's funny now you think how how much you took those moments for granted. And I have a feeling that when we come out of this, hopefully sooner than later, we will not take those moments for granted. Because you and I were talking before before we started recording, and you brought up a memory that, that we had together, me, you, and, and a couple of our video guys, where we were in the hotel room with you a few years ago in Atlanta. You were finalists for the Hall of Fame. And we find yeah. ourselves, once again, Coach, in that exact same situation, where you are looking yeah. now, you are finalists, you are so close to the finish line of getting into the Hall of Fame, a place where obviously I and a lot of people in this building think that you need to be, you deserve to be. But I'm just wondering, as a human being, how do you deal with being so close yet again and not getting your hopes up too high? Like, how are you kind of approaching this next stretch of time? Well, even though the category uh, that they put me in now, and, and, and uh, as I get older, I seem to get in different categories all the time, uh, is, is, you know, the, the chances of my selection this time are, are better than they were last time. And last time I was sitting there with you guys and, and, the, and the camera and everybody's ready for the knock on the door. And instead of the knock on the door, I got the phone call and boy, I tell you, well, you guys watch it. The wind came out of me in a heartbeat. I went home. I, I went home that next morning. Uh, I was so down. But uh, now with a Zoom, I guess they're going to tell us all with a Zoom. And uh, they voted yesterday, so it's pretty hard to keep a secret now until Super Bowl weekend. But uh, somehow they're going to try to do it. And then I, I would imagine somehow they're going to try to make it a, a production on Zoom when they do tell somebody, tell them to be by. And we'll, we'll, I don't know, I haven't heard the whole thing yet, but I'm waiting to hear, just like you guys, I'm not getting too excited about it, but when it does come, if it does or if it doesn't, I promise you, it'll probably be, it'll be emotional both ways. You know, because there are so many people that are, are rooting for you. There are so many people in this building, in Raider Nation, nationally, internationally, that are pulling for you to get in the Hall of Fame. And as I, I said, told you a second ago, I haven't made my feelings about this a secret. I think that it's, it's a travesty that you're not in yet, but I'm hopeful, I'm oh so hopeful, Coach, that the Hall of Fame will finally correct this wrong. They will do the right thing, and you will get into the Hall of Fame in just a little bit of time. But... You know, in addition to all the people like me who are pounding the drum saying, hey, Coach needs to be in the Hall of Fame. Now this year, Coors Light has put their money behind you. They have put their money where their mouth is, and they say, hey, we need to get Coach Flores in the Hall of Fame. So what was it like for you that moment when Coors Light approaches you and says, hey, Tom, we have a crazy, really fun idea. What do you think? Well, you know, I, it all started uh, almost a year ago, I guess. I. Uh, and I met some uh, really fine people from the Eastern Coast, uh, uh, Hispanic people that were uh, had uh, they were involved in uh, in all kinds of stuff, and they were trying to help. And they got I'm not sure how they got together with Coors Light. Coors Light was interested. Uh, they got on board, and uh, we put it together little by little by little. And then on uh, December uh, 14th, I think it was around the 14th, we did it. We did it here in Palm Springs. They couldn't, we couldn't go anywhere. Uh, well, they were thinking of maybe coming to the house here, but, but because of the COVID, they had to isolate themselves and create their own bubble in a house that they rented with a pool in the back. And then there I was drinking my uh, Coors Light uh, by the pool, enjoying myself with, <laughs> I tell, it was fun to do. I started early that morning, they picked me up it was still kind of dark and they brought me home that day was, was kind of dark and uh, a lot of sitting around when you do that but it was fun I mean there were there were some moments there we had a lot of laughs and yeah to make it fun with that I mean it's a once in a lifetime yeah absolutely and and I, you know I got to be honest with you because we we saw the commercials and obviously you can't go anywhere you can't watch tv or go on social media without seeing those commercials right now and they're really good but I got to be honest I was surprised by how good of an actor you are 
Like, you you were really good on camera. I was very, very impressed. Was that kind of hard for you to kind of get out of coach mold and get into, hey, I'm I'm the star of the show right now? Well, one of the things that they asked me to do uh, is, you know, just be natural, be like you were. When I coached, and when I was coaching, I was kind of dull, really. I, I mean, I just, I never, I never yelled and screamed like my friend, like John did, Madden did before me. He was all over the place, and, you know, here I am using my hands. But I was usually like this, and uh, so I did. I I did what I normally do, uh, and I try to give it some charm. <laughs> I well, I think I think you definitely succeeded in giving it some charm. I think that even if you're not a fan of football, if you know nothing about the Raiders or your story, you just look at those objections. You're like, that's a that's a pretty cool guy doing that doing yeah. those commercials. What has the reaction been like from your friends and your family when they've seen those commercials on air on TV? Oh, my, my, my phone. Uh, my cell phone they, and, and my email exploded. I mean, I had so many calls that day and the next day and the rest of the week. And, and since now everybody's calling and said, you hear it, you hear it, you hear it, you hear it, you hear it. Every day I get calls or emails to that effect or Texas, have you heard yet? And I said, no, I've not heard. But it just goes to show you, Coach, how many people are invested in you getting in the Hall of Fame. Pe- so many people want this to happen. And, and I'm curious, too, for your take, because I th- we were talking about the, the commercials and all that stuff, but you look at these cans, Coach. My goodness. I, and listen, as a man who drinks, and I, I'll say this delicately, as a man who drinks a good amount of beer, I got to be honest when I say, I don't know if I've ever seen a beer can that looks this cool. What was your reaction when you saw the can for the first time? Well, when I looked at the can, I said, wow. I said, you know, it's, they told me about it, this or that, it's going to be on the side of a truck. Uh, and then in fact, that's one of the things, uh, one of the one of the, the shots was uh, when the truck goes by and I tell Bart, I, I'm on the, I don't want the truck. But, uh, there, was a, there was another humorous side where we were doing it. And I think they did this, I don't think they're not going to publish, they're not going to tell about it, it's just, but they did it for fun. See my reaction because uh, I'm sitting and I I look at the can and I yell, "Hey Barb, I'm on the can," and then and then they say, "Okay, do it again." Hey Barb, I'm on the can. Wait a minute, I said I can't, I can't say that, <laughs> so I I started laughing and uh, and they laughed. They were, they were, they were trying to have some fun with me, so it was uh, pretty awesome. You know, the, the, you know what's what's kind of awesome about it is that all my friends. My relatives, uh, my children, grandchildren, Raider Nation, they're all sharing in, in all this journey that I'm on right now. And uh, they've all been very supportive. You know, it's, uh, it's a lot of people, a lot yeah. of years. Yeah, I've, I've been in this, I've been a Raider, really, even though I, was, I went other places, 60 years. I started in 1961. 1960, excuse me, the first year of the Raiders. So I've been there all 60, 61 years. Uh, it's a long time. It is a very long time. And, le- and like you said, I think that's been one thing that's been really cool for us to kind of see this campaign, see this journey for you. And obviously the journey, like you said, is a 60-year journey, but kind of in the more immediate. It's been cool to see so many people from so many different walks of life. Like I said, people who are, are, are just Raiders fans, people who just love the game of football, people who are proud Latinos that want to see you in the Hall of Fame for th- that aspect yeah. of, of, your, of your career. But it's been really cool to see people rally around this moment, rally around you. And like I said, hopefully getting, you know, in a few days we find out that you do get that really good news, that news that you and so many people have been waiting for. But what would it mean for you, Coach, to get that, you know, that, I guess, virtual knock on the door or, you know, phone call or Zoom or however they're going to do it these days? What would it mean to you to get that call this time around? It would be the, the culmination of, of my career, of my life, uh, my non, you know, my, uh, my football life, which also was a big part of my real life because my family had to become football families. Football families are special. And, you know, the Raider Nation grew like a family. You know, when the Raider Nation grew, we were a handful of people over at Keysar Stadium in San Francisco. And then there was more, and there was a, f- a few more at Calistic, and then a few more at Frank Hill Field, and then a few more when we got at our Coliseum. And look what it is now. But when it grew, it grew slowly and was strong and dedicated. And, it, I mean, getting in will be... Uh, 
I mean, I will be, I, I'll, well, I don't know what I'm going to be. I'm not going to say what I'm going to be because I don't know. But uh, we're all, they're, we, they're all going in with me. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, like, yeah, well, I feel I'm sure there's a lot of folks that feel like, hey, if coach gets in, part of me gets in, too. Right. And, yeah. and like you said, you bring yeah. up a great point where this organization, this team, this movement has come a long way from Frankie Oldfield. Now we have this beautiful brand new stadium here in Las Vegas. But coach, I got to yeah. ask you before yes. we let you go. And and I know that it's it's the question that so many people get asked, the folks that are in your position. But if you do get in, have you given any thought, any thought to who you want to present you when the time comes? No, no, I have some thoughts, but uh, but I, I don't want to be premature in that. Sure. You know, it's, uh, no, it's, I get. You know, I've got a long sixty-one years. I have a long list of thoughts. You know, Al's Al's not around. Uh, Al Davis, uh, he would have been the first uh, and only one if he were still alive. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. Well, Coach, look. I speak for everyone when I say we are pulling for you so much. We want this to happen for you. It's more than deserving. It's a long time coming. Uh, congratulations on the campaign, which, as I said, has been really fun to watch from afar. Congratulations on the cans. Congratulations on 60 years of success, on 60 years of representing this team, this organization the right way. Congratulations on being a pioneer for so many Latinos in the game of football. And gosh, like I said, we are all pulling for you, and we really hope that the, uh, that moment is yours and it comes in the next couple of days. Well, I appreciate it. all the support. Appreciate it very much. Raiders have been wonderful. The Raider Nation, even more wonderful. So we'll see. Fingers crossed. For a guy that threw the first pass for the Raiders. Tom Flores connects with Billy Lott as the Raiders start off with a passing attack. Then as an assistant coach wins the Super Bowl, then wins two as a head coach. Pretty remarkable. We were the best team. We deserve to be world champions. Woo! I'm proud of you. I'm proud of you. It's time. Tom Flores belongs in the Hall of Fame. And it's our job to say enough's enough. He's my coach. I love him. Of course, I'm biased. But if I look at what he's done and what he's accomplished, he certainly deserves to be in there. When you look at other coaches that are in there that haven't actually done as much. I've been banging this drum for a long time. If you cannot write the history of the NFL without mentioning this person, they're a Hall of Famer. And you cannot tell the story of the NFL without mentioning Tom Flores. He's a Hall of Famer, not only as a coach, but as a person. I know that's something that would certainly, he'd be proud of, his family would be proud of, Raider Nation would be proud of, hopefully, hopefully one day soon. Tom's not a big personality. Tom's not a toot his own horn kind of guy. And it's almost like the player that doesn't celebrate, that you don't see a lot of. That's Tom. And sometimes you could forget how great that player is because that player's not loud. He doesn't have a PR mentality, and that's not Tom. And I think that's hurt him in some people's eyes. He's not out there pumping his chest. He's not out there promoting himself. He just went out there and did the job, and they won. That really blazed the trail for other minority coaches to come along. He never toots his own horn, ever. Sometimes I kind of wish he would, you know, because some of the things he has done are really important and groundbreaking. He thinks that your actions show. You don't have to talk about it. So that's just the way he is. All right, we know what has to be done. And we know how to do it. When it happens, it'll be one of the greatest celebrations, I think, in Raider history. Everybody's been waiting for this. Everybody. I'm hoping that maybe this year will be the year. And if it is, then we'll be uh, partying in the streets. The Raider Nation will, will party around me here. And a big thank you to all of our guests, Paul Gutierrez, Omar Ruiz, John Clayton, and of course, Coach Tom Flores himself. And thank all of you guys for hanging out with us, for being with us in, your, in the car, in the house, wherever you listen to us. We really do appreciate it. And before I get out of here, I also want to say a special thank you to our friends at Coors Light. For those of you who listen to the show, you know that Coors Light has been a part of this show now for, gosh, almost a year. Crazy how time flies. Crazy how time doesn't really exist 
in the COVID era that we're living in, but they've been with us for a long time. They have been immensely helpful for a lot of the things that we want to do on the show, and we're really excited about what the future is going to hold. But specifically referring to today, just a big thank you to Coors Light for not only, one, putting together this incredible campaign, but for getting us some of these cans that we got to show off. Those of you who are watching the video version of the podcast will see the, uh, we'll see the cans out there. But it has been a long time coming for Coach Flores. It really has. Oh, and before I forget, too, before I, I officially wrap it up, those of you who guys are, those of you who are in Las Vegas and want to get your hands on those cans, they are available locally here in the desert. Uh, and if you go to the, the Coors Light Tom Flores campaign website, there's actually a pretty nifty little store finder in there where you just put in your zip code, yada, yada, hit the, hit the search button, and it'll show you locally where you can go pick them up. And I couldn't encourage you guys to, enough to pick them up because, uh, as I said, they are super, super duper cool. And any, you know, a great addition to any kind of Raiders fans memorabilia collection, the fridge, because they're still delicious too. I mean, even though they are, you know, special cans, I mean, the goods are still the goods inside. So you guys know what I mean. Enjoy it. Go out, buy some cans, support Coach Flores. And, and as, as I said, it has been a long time coming. It really has. And I am so hopeful that this is the final conversa- the final time we're going to have this conversation. And as I said, I really, in my heart of hearts, believe this is the year for Coach Flores to get in the Hall of Fame. So for Eddie Pascal, Engineer Jim, all of our guests this week and our friend Alexandra behind the glass and everyone at Silver and Black Productions, we thank you deeply, humbly, and oh so sincerely. And just a reminder, Raider Nation, stay safe, stay healthy, and we will catch you guys next week for our usual episode of Upon Further Review.